Okay, thank, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, this is the panel on uh, migrant diaspora and minority writing. Um, I'm Susan Harris with Words Without Borders, and our panelists are um, uh, Jawan Merkulek to my right, a Kurdish author and literary translator from Eastern Turkey. He's the author of three novels in Kurdish and also translates from English and Spanish into Kurdish. Uh, to his right, we have Ararat Shikaryan, um, the editor with the Istanbul-based Armenian publishing house Aras, who publishes both Armenian and Turkish lit and uh, Armenian literature in Armenian and Turkish. And on the far right, Nanor Kabranian, who is assistant professor of Armenian languages and literature at Columbia University in the Department of Middle Eastern, Southeast Asia, and African Studies. Um, and again, we know that minority writing takes many forms across Europe. Uh, we also know that the guest, the guest of honor this, uh, at London this year is Turkey, but obviously uh, Turkish is far from the only language be, uh, being written in in the country. Um, both the Armenians and the Kurds in Turkey are part of a lo larger cultural group, which has a homeland, but also exists in diaspora. And of course, the Kurds in their own lang, in their own land, but uh, writing and speaking a language that was until quite recently banned in Turkey. Um, we want to talk about overcoming the barriers to dialogue and exchange. Um, we want to talk about how the writers of these two communities are translated into other languages, but also into Turkish and what stands in, in the way of translating them into other languages, and of course the major languages including English. And of course, how is their experience different from migrant, those of migrant writers who adapt the languages of their new countries? So again, we have an author, we have a publisher, and we have a critic, a scholar, an educator. And I thought we would open with uh, Siwan Mer, Siwan Mer uh, speaking from the writer's perspective um, and talking about the role of the Kurdish writer uh, living again in one's own country but writing in one's own language, which is the minority language. All right. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, all the audience who have been present here. Actually, I'm honored to be here, and this is the first time I am abroad. When my friends and colleagues and fellows heard that I was invited to the London Book Fair, they insisted that I go and represent them because they have many problems, they have troubles, and nobody hears them, nobody listens to them, and they don't have a state, they don't have a mass media, they don't have any representatives. Who are they? They thought that they are Kurdish people in Turkey, and they have a different identity, although being a part of Turkey. Now, when you have the burden of representation, representing a culture and identity, uh, you, you, you found yourself in a very uh, controversial situation, beginning with my first sentence when I say that that is the first time I am abroad. It implies that there is a country, I come from that country, that country is my homeland, and here is abroad. Actually, when we think so, most of us will say this, yes, I come from Turkey, as Susan said, eastern of Turkey. Many Kurds say that, no, it is northern of Kurdistan. But uh, the controversy arising there, I want to draw upon my personal experiences and story, which may be uh, um, more, which will make our case more evident. Um, when I was a, a small child, I was six years old, and in the 90s, 1990s, yes, uh, many villages, uh, Kurdish village was devastated by the army and people migrated to the city towns and I, uh, my mom moved our house to a, a town in Diyarbakir and I began school there. I didn't know Turkish, the official, the only language was Turkish, although we were living in our native land. When I went, when I got, I went to school, uh, I was the only boy in my family, I had eight sisters, and uh, 
so my parents liked me so much, they enrolled one of my elder sisters so that she would accompany me in the school because I was a foreigner, I didn't know the language, and the school was totally uh, uh, strange to me. Uh, but the, the, f the only phrase I heard at school, which was in Kurdish, that our teacher always called my elder sister Karachole, which means a country donkey and uh, an ass, you see. And I was very ashamed after that. I protested against my parents. I said that she mustn't come to school again with me. I will go on my own. And at that time, my parents would always talk about an concept, a place called Anatolia. My parents would say, oh, a, a certain family went to Anatolia. That guy is working now in this city of Anatolia. And I was, I, I wondered, I, I was very curious because at school they told us that Turkey is made up of seven regions, geographical regions, Eastern Anatolia, uh, Southeastern Anatolia, Inland Anatolia, etc. Anatolia, Anatolia. But I thought that we live in Anatolia. Why my parents say that that guy is living in Anatolia, in that city of Anatolia? as if it was a different place. And later I learned that what my parents called it Anatolia was in fact Turkey. As a child I thought Turkey as a state, not a country, because although my uh, parents were ignorant, they had no formal education, in their mind throughout years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, they had a uh, they had in their mind a country which was not called Anatolia or Turkey. But what was that? What was the name of the country? So, in the school they said, all of you are Turks. Although we didn't understand the, even the language at first. So what is Turks? My first conception, perception of being a Turk was the ones who were richer in our town, who uh, had a fridge in their home, who had TV sets at their homes, were Turks because only they had those kinds of And I associated these things with being Turk. Uh, the woman who didn't wear uh, hat scarves like my mom's, who bought bread from shops, but not uh, baking bread in the tandoor, what we call uh, uh, clay ovens uh, used by Kurdish families. We, all of us, will bake uh, bread there. And I thought that who bakes bread in the clay ovens, tenders, they are Turks. So when these notions clashed, your identity, your psychology is divided, which reflects the exact situation of Kurd and Kurdistan, which is exactly divided by four countries. So when we, uh, when we, think in the line of Turkish regime, governments, Turkish uh, notions, when if uh, we live in East Turkey, so where is West Turkey? Where is Western Turkey? And if my mom went to a Western Turkey country, she wouldn't think she is in the same country. Different customs, different languages, different traditions, different political views, uh, different engagements. So she wouldn't be able to live a single day without a guide or uh, uh, some anybody helping her. But uh, on the other hand, where is the other part of our country which is uh, prohibited to call it with its proper name for many years in Turkey? Because uh, we, for a long time, for, for nearly a century, Kurdish was banned in Turkey. They say Kurdish didn't exist, but they prosecuted many people because they were Kurds. Many people were put in prison because they were Kurd. So some, thing, some unexisting things were always tortured and uh, under pressure. But the... the uh, Maybe the ruling society who, uh, who named themselves as Turks or the ruling society of in Iraq or in Syria or in Iran, let's say, they always called Kurds separate 
sectors, separatists. Why? Because the Kurds wanted to separate their countries. But actually, when we talk about their country, they are the borders which are made, most of them, after the First World War, and dividing the Kurdish society to four, four parts. And the... Uh, now, the another controversy, contradiction arises here again, when I want to go to, go to for example, south of Kurdistan, which we say the country, I need a passport to go there. When I want to go to the eastern Kurdistan, I, I need a passport again. Or west Kurdistan, I need a passport. You see, you are a foreigner in your own country. You need a passport to communicate with your natives, but you are suppressed in a country which doesn't even acknowledge your language, your identity, your culture for a long time. And that political background forms the Kurds' view of themselves, the notions of themselves. How do they assess themselves? How do they know uh, themselves? It is, I think, very obvious that the other always defines your notion of yourself. If the other, the another in Turkey, uh, uh, wants to exterminate yourself, then your identity is built up in a somewhat hostility to that ruling society who wants to oppress you. For example, when you imagine about Kurdish scholars in Syria, in Iran, in Iraq, they come together and they want to decide over and grammatical issue, let's say, or vocabulary of modern Kurdish language. If there is a, a, a word which resonates with a Kurdish, with a Turkish word, or which is borrowed from, let's say, Turkish language, they very severely protest a Turkish word in Kurdish. They don't want to see, because it is reminiscent of something. They don't want to see it, and that the very controversial situation leads to very controversial and maybe not unfair situations. You cannot be objective when you build up your language. When I talk about uh, building up a uh, uh, language and identity, we must uh, take a look at the last century of Kurdish, uh, that's development of Kurdish language and literature. It's very interesting that the Kurdish language and literature, literary movement began after the defeats, after the failures of many rebellions and revolts. So that created a situation that all the modernist Kurdish literary movement began, emerged in diaspora outside the country, outside the native land. Where did it begin? For example, after the last after the, let's say, dis destruction of the last Kurdish Emirates in Jizre in, in 1856, the, the sons and grandsons of the last Kurdish, let's say, lord or prince went into the exile. And in Cairo, they published the first Kurdish uh, newspaper. And when, when we pursue, when we follow the centers, it, co it goes from Cairo to Beirut, to Switzerland, to Sweden, to Soviet Union. The first Kurdish novel was written in Soviet Union, in Armenia, in Yerevan. And uh, Kurdish literature flourished there, uh, very away from its own land. And uh, in the 20th century, again, in the, in the last decade of, uh, last decades of, let's say, the, the second half of 20th century in, Swe in Sweden, in Europe. The Kurdish, you, can, you couldn't see a Kurdish book, a magazine, even a word, a written, a single word or sentence because it, ca it could cause a death, a killing, a prison. So mo a, a greater part of the now modern Kurdish literature was written in, let's say, Sweden because it was free there to be a Kurd. 
but it, it wasn't, uh, you weren't allowed to be occurred in your own land. But after the uh, 1991, when the language ban was a bit loosened in the constitution, Kurdish newspapers uh, published it again in Istanbul. Still not in the when, what we, Susan called Eastern Turkey and what the Kur many Kurds called uh, Northern Kurdistan. Uh, still nothing was published there. In Istanbul, it began in Istanbul, but in the, after 2000, in the 21st century, Kurdish literature, after a long journey in the diaspora, in the foreign country, returned its home. Now, most of the Kurdish literature is uh, done in Diyarbakir, which is a central uh, city in the northern Kurdistan, or let's say East uh, Turkey, because I, I cannot decide uh, really. It's a very difficult situation. We are, in a sense, we are, we are very entangled with each other. In a sense, we are very separated from each other. So you have a great difficulty even in calling yourself, in defining yourself. and. Uh, so uh, I want now uh, to talk about the current situation in Kurdish literature. Uh, according to a statistic, and by the way, uh, there aren't much many statistics uh, uh, concerning the Kurdish situation, language and literature, because it's a newly uh, flourishing area, let's say. Uh, last year, 40,000 titles, books were published in Turkey and only 260 titles were in Kurdish. Maybe it's a, a very, a very small number, but for us, it's a, a great, a huge number, because when you imagine that from uh, 1900 to 2000, only 10 books were published and they weren't allowed to be even delivered. It is a great number, unbelievable novel for the Kurdish literature because the year before, in 2011, 140 books were published and the year before, 100, uh, 110 books published. Every year it is increasing. After uh, the Kurdish uh, is free in some universities, now students are allowed to have a Kurdish course in primary schools, even though it's a very short time for a an hour or two hours, it triggered uh, situation, a longing for the Kurdish who uh, didn't believe that they could see the language printed. Let me tell an anecdote. One of my friends said that he, he took her grandma to the doctor and he started to, uh, to tell the complaints of her grandma to the doctor and doctor started to talk in Kurdish, started to listen to the woman and her troubles, her complaints in Kurdish. And my friend said that her grandma stopped and turned to me and said, son said, he can't be a doctor. How come that he is a doctor? He talks Kurdish. So uh, it, it, the, the language ban and oppressing a uh, culture an identity led to a self-inferiority uh, in people. And now people are starting to, to feel self-confident to become themselves. When they become themselves, they can sympathize with the others who you, talk, you, uh, you think yourself to be different from. You try to uh, maybe separate yourself. You try to eradicate, eliminate his words from your dictionary. Maybe you try, you, 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 began, you begin to, to like him. You begin to associate himself, uh, yourself with him. And I think that is the, where the solution began. When you can become yourself, you can become the others. And uh, I think that is a process in, in, in Turkey now, uh, which uh, began very late, but uh, thanks God it began. And people will begin to, uh, uh, begin to understand themselves uh, better. 
all, all the many Turkish nationalists, when they oppose to the Kurdish rights, they say, if you talk Kurdish, if you write in Kurdish, if you uh, sing songs in Kurdish, how will we understand you? But I am educated. I studied in Turkish schools. I studied in Turkish universities. Even though I speak Turkish, still they don't understand me. The problem is not language. The problem is to understand, to perceive the situation. I think when I can talk my language and I can publish in my language, then they will get rid of all their fears, their worries, their concerns, and they will understand you better. Now, my one of my sis, uh, sister is uh, studying at the university in Bursa, the first Ottoman capital city. It's a Turkish city in in the sense that when we call our country Kurdistan, she is in 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 our uh, in a different country, but without passport. Let's say, still. When my mom or my father talks with her on the phone, always my father or my mother is cautious and asking her, are there any of your friends around? She, she means uh, Turkish friends. She's cautious and she's worried about her because she thinks, she feels that when she talks Kurdish, her friends maybe will beat her or will isolate her or will uh, cut ties with her, because all of these things are experienced many years, and now they are sunk, they are stamped on people's mind, and even all the Kurdish peoples are cautious when they are in a, in an, uh, let's say in Turkey countries where it is highly Turkish populated uh, cities. So I, I think the, the growth of literature literary movements of translation will close the gap between people and uh, will end all uh, these fears, concerns, both for Kurds and uh, for Turks. Do I have time? Yes, just yes. So if we are, um, one more, uh, Ararat, we have talked um, about the, um, about Kurds within Turkey living in their country and yet not of it. Again, is it Eastern Turkey? Is it Kurdistan? Um, you, on the other hand, are working in a publishing house that does Armenian and Turkish, and so your role as an advocate is, your role within your house is, in fact, a microcosm of what, um, of what is going on in trying to maintain the Armenian identity in Turkey. Uh, can you talk about that? Uh, sure, sure. Um, as you as you told, uh, I'm working in a publishing house uh, which published books uh, in Armenian and in Turkish. And uh, the goal uh, the goal is to to translate Armenian literature after like uh, 80, 85 years old uh, 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 years of uh, gap, let's say emptiness, let's say. Starting from the First World War, 1915, let's say the the genocide events, which was uh, destroyed all the Armenian culture, all the Armenian life, and uh, all the uh, that's uh, the, the most important one, all the Ar Armenian intellectual life. So the publishing house was founded in uh, 1993, just to 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 let's say to publish uh, Armenian works uh, in Armenian language. Uh, which was again uh, has the same had the same situation with the Kurdish language. It was it was not banned, let's say officially not banned, but it was uh, practically banned. Banned. Uh, I would like to add a personal uh, experience as Jovan Met also started with a personal experience. It was like we we have our schools uh, as for the Armenian language, let's say, and Armenian schools. We have our schools uh, in Istanbul. Thanks to the Lausanne Treaty uh, signed after the First World War, we have 20, 25 Armenian schools. We, we can learn Armenian, but it was uh, for for us uh, it was forbidden to speak Armenian in, in streets. Like uh, you cannot speak with your mom, you cannot speak with your father in Armenian. That's that shows the fear. Uh, that shows the the psychology of Armenian. Um, let's say 
people living in Istanbul. So uh, as for the publishing publishing house, uh, we, we translate books in Armenian. Uh, as I said, after 90 uh, years of emptiness and gap, uh, and then we, we translate actually Armenian uh, literature uh, into Turkish. And as an editor or as translators, what kind of problems we have? I, I would like to, to mention some, some uh, important, let's say, prom big problems. As uh, it was a practically banned uh, language and it was officially ignored uh, language, uh, speaking about Armenian language, uh, you, you cannot um, learn, uh, let's say, Armenian language in a university in Turkey. So that's the biggest problem. You have you, you don't have a department which which uh, teaches you Armenian language or Armenian literature, so uh, you don't have professional translators, professional Armenian, uh, let's say Armenian literature literature cr critics and so on. So uh, and uh, when when you are going to when you found a let's say publishing house and when when your goal is publishing uh, Armenian literature into Turkish that's the big, biggest problem of yours so you you need to work with uh, amateur let's say not professional uh, Armenian translators and here comes the role of the editor here uh, role of the let's say the proofreader or the mm, uh, the publisher so you you need to check every line you need to check every word so that that was that was a translation of an of an uh, amateur translator. So y you have a big problem there, and that's why actually uh, our publishing house uh, Aras uh, just uh, published like 140 books in 20 years. And you, you may see like a 20 years old uh, publishing house in in Turkey will publish like more than 500 or 600 books for for 20 years. That's that's a long time. Um, I would like to add some, let's say, uh, as the, the we, we are talking about the minority literature and translation, uh, we, we need to mention, I think, some political and sociological uh, backgrounds. Uh, as, like, Juan Mert talked about that fresh problems, let's say, we, 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 we see and we listen uh, fresh problems, fresh Kurdish problem, which was uh, started in 1980s and 1990s, and which is still going on. But we are, when we are talking about the Armenian literature and our Armenian translation, we have, uh, let's say, a hundred years old problem and a hundred years old that political and sociological problem, and we we don't uh, see uh, in front of in front of us. We don't see that uh, fresh problems, but let's say. Uh, dead, uh, dead problems, and uh, now uh, that's that's actually what we are doing in the publishing house. That's what, what actually we are, we are uh, struggling. That let's say we, uh, the remnants of of that problems, that hundred years of problems, affect us today. Like uh, we don't have uh, professional uh, translators. We don't have even. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to say it, but we, we don't have. Uh, even a um, writer who can write in Armenian. That, that's the point, actually. I was like uh, a, a little bit ashamed as uh, a, a young writer, Joan Mert, uh, who is writing in Kurdish in, in his language. Uh, he's uh, 27, 28, or 30, let's say, years old. But I cannot show, show you a young uh, Armenian uh, writer in Turkey. So that's the point. That's like pra practically banned literature that's uh, old uh, psychological pressure let's say uh, made by the government uh, that's that's all that sociological problems that's the, that 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 fear of armenians let's say uh, i will i would like to mention that uh, in 1919 when when the publishing house was founded and even in uh, after that years let's say the word armenian uh, was used as a Let, let's say, pro, uh, um, as a as an insult by uh, even by by the president, let's say by the official people, uh, they were like uh, calling themselves uh, their uh, op opposers, let's say, uh, Armenians, uh, as an insult. So that that shows us the the fear of the people. That shows us the, why a young Armenian doesn't write in uh, Armenian language, but. Uh, 
we have writers uh, who write in Turkish in a ma major, uh, majority language. Uh, so uh, as for the Armenian literature, we, we, al we uh, always need to uh, think about this political, sociological background and uh, we, we don't we don't uh, we, we, do, we we don't have to forget about it let's say that uh, political problems and sociological problems and that uh, that how the the armenian literature uh, day by day uh, it that's sad for me but that dies in turkey and actually it's died already so <laughs> that's all actually for for this question um, and uh, Again, what, what we've been talking about also, the, uh, the overlap of the political and the cultural is such an important part of communicating the literature. But again, as Ararat was saying, where there is no training and no tradition of professional, uh, no tradition of professional translation, that in effect, um, it certainly um, is a huge obstacle to overcome. Nanor, what... Uh, how, how does the, the role of the critic and the educator then pick up um, to assist with this dissemination? The question of dissemination itself needs to be clarified. What exactly yes. is going to be disseminated? I mean, the point that Ararat makes is the really salient point, which is that we're talking about effectively a dead language or a language in a coma, right? Um, and so when you're dealing with that kind of a language, are you talking about disseminating works that predate, that are not contemporary, yes. um, that predate today, or are we talking about writing in Armenian first mm -hmm. and then translating and disseminating? So uh, the, qu the point that Arara just, just um, made about the fact that the absence of Armenian language literature in Turkey is due to a certain um, political climate or a climate of oppression and fear, I'm not entirely in agreement with. Um, especially as a scholar of Armenian literature, as a scholar of comparative literature, because it is a global phenomenon. Yes. So the fact is that Armenian writers, young Armenian writers, are simply not writing because they don't exist, because Armenian language proficiency is so hard to come by. And that is the obvious uh, consequence of a diasporic existence, the inevitable dissolution, dismantling, of not just a literary culture, but culture altogether and community altogether. So the role of the scholar and the critic then is one, to keep things really honest, um, to acknowledge the fact that we are dealing with a language and literature that is in its death throes, right? Um, the other is to um, remind people that this literature actually exists, that this language actually exists, or at least existed, right? Um, the other is to break out of these national and nationalist paradigms to adopt a very comparative and global outlook. Because if you want to interest the world in what you have and need to say, you need to be able to understand the languages of the world. And by languages, I don't mean actual spoken or written languages. I mean the ideas of the world. And one of the real obstacles in the fact that perhaps Armenian literature never broke into a kind of world literary culture, wasn't the language itself. It was the, the real compromising of ideas, um, which was the natural outcome of a nationalist trajectory. Um, this is a question I have for Jivan Mirt, because in his um, presentation, I picked up a lot of things that are very familiar to me from the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, which is the alignment of nationalism with literature and the absolutely dire consequences that can have precisely in enabling dialogue, precisely in representing selves. Because when you align nationalism with literature, whether it's Turkish, Kurdish, or Armenian, you effectively um, sideline, you marginalize certain selves in favor of others. And this, I think, um, with all humility, I present as a real consideration to all Kurdish writers, all writers in Turkey, and all Armenian writers, right? Um, as far as dissemination, I and my peers and my predecessors um, go the way of all academics, which is to organize conferences, seminars, and to teach. 
um, and to try to make our courses as interdisciplinary as possible. Um, we also translate, and that's something that also needs to be acknowledged in terms of the Armenian um, literary translation heritage. These semi-professional translators in the Armenian tradition were often scholars, um, as well as writers, as well as publishers. Um, and so our task also, to a certain extent, as scholars, as few of us as there are, is to be translators um, and to enable our students, and not just Armenian students, to read in a literary manner and to read in the manner, potentially, of a translator. So that I can think of uh, one of our one of my senior colleagues, for example, who works in Paris at Inalco. And he offers a fantastic course on Armenian translation. So between French and Armenian, Armenian French. And the idea precisely is A, to enable these younger students, and he does have several younger students, to read in a literary manner, right? In other words, not to read in terms of um, notions of preservation, for example, not to read as a matter of patriotism or national heritage, but to read literature as art and to understand it and interpret it as such. That is the first step toward being able to translate, right? Before you actually get to the language. So that is precisely what he does. That is precisely what he do, uh, I do and what others do as well. Um, the other is really to encourage those who are interested in Armenian literature language um, to learn other languages, right? Outside of the kind of um, Euro-American paradigm. So I encourage my students, as few as there are, to encourage uh, to learn Turkish and to learn Arabic as well. So this isn't just an issue of Armenian-Turkish translation. It's not an issue of um, minority, majority translation. It's just a general issue, I think, to some extent, of uh, globalizing our awareness and of really understanding how trends are proceeding and how we can actually engage in those trends. So one more, what, what, um, how do you see, as, as the writer, what do you see as the, um, as the obstacles to getting Kurdish work translated into English as well as into, into Turkish? Now, clearly there is some English language activity. Uh, transcript has a current issue of Armenian literature that I recommend everyone check out. Um, Words Without Borders will be doing a Kurdish literature issue in January of next year, and we'll also be doing an Armenian feature. Obviously, getting work into English is, I think, crucial. English is, again, such, um, such a bridge language. It's crucial for getting, getting work into English, also uh, gets it into uh, gets it on the radar of, um, globally, and again, as, as Nanar says, to get a sense of a global literary conversation. Um, so, Omar, what, what, what do you see as, is it more likely, do you think, that Kurdish will be uh, translated into other languages than into Turkish first, or what, what do you see? Uh, yeah, I have, is it open? Sorry? Is it open? Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have made some translation actually from English and uh, uh, Spanish and one from Turkish. Uh, t trans translation really opens up very great uh, opportunities for a language to develop. When we talked about language, uh, Nanor uh, mentioned nationalism and language. It, it reminded me uh, a remark by James Joyce, who who is who was reported to say to have said that if if you uh, if you if you accept the language, he could be considered an Irish nationalist. He pursued, supported all the Irish nationalistic ideas except from language because, and he, uh, he, he has written all of his works in English because he thought that an I English which has developed, progressed so much in time, which has been used and overused as many opportunities for him, so why not uh, writing in English instead of an Irish? This, this is a case, uh, I think, uh, very close 
to our situation, but in a different way. If you omit language, you cannot mention a Kurdish nationalism. It is the pillar, the core, uh, the locomotive of Kurdish nationalism. Be, be, uh, 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 grandson of uh, Mir Badr Khan, which I mentioned, the, the, the last rebel in the Ottoman time, has a uh, modernized Kurdish language and alphabet. He public, published a magazine in Damascus, now Syrian Sham. He, uh, his, f his statement no, is now supported by many Kurdish nationalists. We say that what differentiates a nation from another is either a land, either a religion, or language. He says, we, along with the, our other neighbors, have the same land and same religion. So what differentiates us is language. The, that is why the Kurdish intellectuals, writers, or let's say scholars, uh, give a, a very high importance to Kurdish. They, they, they consider it of vital importance. For myself, as a person, as a writer, let's say, the experience, the, the story of Kurdish began as a creative opportunity because I think myself as a writer of fiction. And I, I, I suppose that even nobody speaks Turkish, Kurdish. If nobody says I'm a Kurd, if nobody reads in Kurdish, I would like to write in Kurdish because I feel at home in Kurdish. But there is a problem. Who will read you? Who will understand you? If language must be a common thing. You give an essence and that must be conveyed. And a, a banned language, how will it develop, standardize itself to a level that everybody understands and uses it in more or less the same uh, manner? Translation is, I think, one of the tools wh wh with which we can achieve this goal. I translate from other languages in Kurdish in a way to both to use the opportunities of language and both to strengthen the language, to standardize the language, to create a standard for the others who would like to translate into Kurdish. That means that you intervene with the language uh, uh, for instance, when mom, my, my mother or my, my father, when they talk Kurdish, I end up sometimes correcting them. I say, mom, no, this is not say like that, but it's like that. You should say so, but you shouldn't say like that, etc. And that is, uh, I think, a prototype for what is happening in the Kurdish intelligentsia. They are f forming, they are inventing in a sense, a language. You are polishing a language. You want to create a mirror where everyone, every single person can see himself, his reflection in that mirror, which is a language. The, the translating from another language into Kurdish is uh, more or less settled now. Uh, there are more than 20 Kurdish TV channels. It has a standardized language and uh, there are many films, documentaries from different languages are translated inevitably into Kurdish. So uh, there is a progress in it. But translating from Kurdish into another language, now uh, it, it still uh, offers, a, it's a highly problematic because there aren't universities, there aren't schools, there aren't professional. I myself, train myself solely on my own and nearly all of the Kurdish intellectuals does so. But uh, imagine or uh, just bear in mind that there is no single Kurdish writer, intellectual, politician, anyone who has a formal education from primary school to university. There is nobody. So the that makes the problem, the greatest part of problem. There isn't a, a formally educated people, staff, to do this. But 
most of the people voluntarily, willingly uh, endeavor to achieve this. And there is in, uh, maybe a, a little progress in it, but I'm not sure where, uh, in, uh, soon, in soon whether there will be many translators translating uh, Kurdish into other languages. For Kurdish, there are translated works from Kurdish into Turkish, right? For English, very, very few. For other languages, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think in time, as time goes by, uh, as they say, there, there will be a wide area and a lot of people doing that because Kurdish literature is developing very rapidly and uh, a readership is emerging. Uh, so th there is a need and there will be a pressure to, b to be translated to the other languages. I, I, I guess that there are some publishers who would like to see some Kurdish works in Turkish and other languages. I hear about these things from time to time. And if there is a need, if there is a demand, like the in, in industry they say, so there will be staff. Because people began to earn money from Kurdish, even in Turkey, where you, when, you pronounce, when you pronounce a word in Kurdish, you will be uh, killed or dead, or maybe you, you will have a very bad situation. You, will, you, you, can, you could find yourself in a trouble. Now, even states would like to have Kurdish-speaking, uh, uh, Kurdish writing staff and other institutions. And so, an industry is developing there. And I, I, I am hopeful and optimistic for uh, this matter. And I think there will be translators, maybe not now, maybe not tomorrow, but in a near future. Yes, I'm hopeful. OK. Um, I've read, uh, how, how do you see the, the future move, moving ahead for uh, for uh, for publishing Armenian in in Turkey? Is it is it what do you see coming? Um, actually, th there is a uh, as Juan Mert said a, a demand from uh, mm. so little, but from Turkish intellectuals, let's say, because uh, our let's say. Um, who, who buy our books, they are, are academicians, uh, Turkish intellectuals, and there is a big demand. They're like hearing from their friends and th their, let's say, teachers, uh, professors, oh, there is a book something uh, about this region of uh, Turkey, there is a book of uh, a history of Turkey in Armenian, why don't you translate it? There is a demand, but uh, I don't see uh, that a bright feature for Armenian publishing, uh, publishing in Armenian language, uh, but uh, th there is a let's say uh, a bright future for for translating, uh, and that's actually what Turkey needs for 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 its uh, if if Turkey now uh, in a d uh, period of the, the let's say democratization that's what Turkey needs for translating works uh, from Kurdish from Armenian or from Greek let's say because there was a Greek literature in Turkey before the First World War there were Greek people. There was a Jewish literature uh, in Turkey, but uh, on the other hand, we see like, we are in a London Book Fair, and the uh, uh, interesting example, the, the uh, focus market, or how do you call it, market focus uh, country is Turkey, and you you see that uh, interesting design everywhere, and you have there the the Turkey in all its colors. But you cannot see an uh, Armenian book there, or, or a book in Kurdish, or even a translation from Armenian. Or let's say, wh why uh, why an uh, Armenian publisher or, uh, or Jewish publisher was not invited to the fair? So that's not uh, all colors, but that's all gray, I think, for now. <laughs> okay. So th th that's an interesting, uh, that implies us uh, the, the, the period of the democratization, so-called, uh, of Turkey. Um, we, we, we should be feeling hopeful. I do feel hopeful, but uh, there is an not that bright future for for this, I would say, uh, for this uh, publishing and translating. I think, Nanor, we, we, we go back to your point of saying that we, we, although obviously the political element is 
inherent. We we cannot link nas we cannot link na literature with nationalism. That we have to have um, that we are conducting a global global conversation in which um, all literatures are part. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and and Any again the qu the question of. Um, Making our and and particularly with Armenian work, um, and again I misspoke. The issue of transcript is not Kurdish; it's Armenian. I beg your pardon. Um, I, I apologize. Um, but uh, but also again, as um, you know, there are not there are not Armenian departments as such. There are not um, Armenian in particular is not a special is not a specialized area of of. Uh, of focus throughout the uni the university uh, or the American university system, um, it is part of a, glo of a of a larger area. So again, underscoring that notion of bringing literature into into the global into the world conversation through uh, through English and also uh, into other languages as well. Yeah, I don't know if I understood what you were saying about the the departmentalization of Armenian. It is actually taught throughout various significant but universities at, as a program yes, with endowed chairs in Armenian studies in yes. the U.S., not the case in Turkey. Right. Um, and that's a significant difference. Right. Um, that said, a lot of students who can manage, who can afford it, um, are actually coming to the U.S. So students from Very Turkey good. coming to the U.S., and learning Armenian, either Armenian or Turkish or Kurdish or whatever. Wonderful. So there is a culture of um, comparative literary studies of Armenian and Turkish, and not just Armenian and Turkish, but of minority Turkish literatures, as in contemporary minority literatures, but also a tradition that's kind of um, overlooked, but that is incredibly fascinating. Um, which is the, the Armeno-Turkish or um, Karamanda traditions um, in which you had transliterations of Turkish in quote-unquote minority alphabets, right? And that has also become a very interesting field of study right now. Um, there's an expert at um, Oxford at the moment, Laurent Mignon, who works on that sort of thing, that is main area of interest. So as far as educating yourself goes, the opportunities are there. Um, we all know how to use websites and Google. <laughs> and the rest of us are trying to kind of network even more in academia by collaborating, for example, with um, transcript, Words Without Borders, et cetera, okay. and making things available online um, in order to attract greater attention to this part of the world and the literature of this part of the world. Good. Okay, well, um, I think we are out of time, so thank you all. Thank you to the p panelists, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.